Welcome to MSL Presents A Question of Law. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The topic for today's show, Barred from the Bar, a history of women and the legal profession, as told to us by Hedda Garza. Women are district attorneys, hired, of course, by state governments and city governments and so on. Women in law are not usually in high places. When it's a private concern, very few women judges and so forth. And when women are made allowed to be lawyers and allowed to be judges, they very rarely are in positions of power. They're women judges in family courts, in various lower courts, two women on the Supreme Court out of nine, right? Finally, after much pressure. So as you know, two women, Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, sit as associate justices of the highest court in our land, the United States Supreme Court. However, what you may not know is that Sandra Day O'Connor could not get a job as an attorney when she graduated third highest in her class from Stanford. Her only job offer was that of a legal secretary. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who tied for first place in Harvard's graduating class, could not find anyone to hire her. In the half hour that follows, we will discuss the struggles of women to obtain admission to law schools and equality before the bar, as well as some of the history of women's rights. Joining me for this discussion, Professor James Cockroft, a three-time Fulbright Scholar. Jim is widely published. He's an award-winning author of 30 books who lived and worked with Hedda Garzer from 1982 until her death in 1995. He has been a longtime human rights activist. Jim, thank you for your assistance with the show. Thank, thank you for joining us here today. Bridgette Jana, an attorney joining us coming from Quebec, Canada. Thank you for being here and for your tolerance with how I pronounce your name. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> attorney Michael Smith from New York City where he practices medical malpractice and tort law. He is the author of Lawyers You'll Like, believe it or not. He has testified on human rights before committees of the United States Congress and the United Nations. Welcome, Michael. Thank nice you for be being here. here. The Honorable Carol Arbor, Judge of the Civil Court of the City of New York. Formerly, she has acted as a Supreme Court Justice of the New York Supreme Court. She is a member of innumerable professional associations and serves on many committees. Delighted you've joined us. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for having me. And Dawn Bradley Berry is a writer and an attorney who lives in New Mexico. One of her books entitled The 50 Most Influential Women in American Law is a terrific and a fascinating portrayal of the women trailblazers who battled the notion that women are too frail, too timid, too illogical, and too much of a distraction to practice law. It's truly a great read. Dawn, thank you for joining us today, coming all the way from New Mexico. <laughs> My pleasure. And I'm Diane Sullivan, a professor at MSL. Panel, let's begin. Tell us about Myra Bradwell. Jim? Well, Myra Bradwell, the real pioneer of the 19th century uh, in law in general, she put out a wonderful magazine uh, that was the most widely distributed and read uh, news source on all the prominent court cases and some of the less prominent ones. Everyone in the legal profession read it, but she herself was not allowed to practice law. She came from a prominent family. She seemed to have everything going for her, but because of the... Uh, discrimination against women. Uh, she could not uh, get her law license and so on. So because of her gender, she was precluded from obtaining a license to practice exactly. law. Exactly. And the impressive thing to me is that she spent her entire life fighting for other women and minorities to have the right to uh, practice law. Michael? When she pioneered the fight to get women uh, uh, into the bar, uh, she came from Illinois. Uh, her most famous client uh, was Abraham Lincoln's widow, Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, and that's a good story. Uh, you'll remember, Jim. Right. I just had and I, in fact, have a chapter in a future book uh, post her death coming out uh, with the same publisher uh, in a year from now on the uh, case. And uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, in those days, a husband, even a son, could, sent, uh, could have the wife or the mother sent to an insane asylum. Without so much as a court hearing, as no. I understand from your book. Exactly, and uh, from Hedda's book, and exactly. And so uh, Myra uh, Bradwell was a friend of the Lincolns from way back when, and uh, she went and literally, uh, according to Mary Todd Lincoln, saved Mary Todd Lincoln's life by getting her out of the insane asylum after four very cruel months in uh, Batavia Insane Asylum outside Chicago. Myra was quite a woman. Let me ask a different question. Why were women viewed at that time generally as unfit to practice law? Carol? 
there was a notion that women weren't suited to the legal profession, that women should be staying at home. And that was not so veiled as it is today. Um, and Myra Bradwell was a terrific example of, um, of polyphrenic women. Um, many functions. I'd like to think of her as a role model, but also as sort of a cross between Nancy Drew and Florence Nightingale. What a great description. <laughs> she found her niche by creating a legal publication that was indispensable to lawyers. At that time, there was a great lag between the time the legislature would enact a new law or change a law and publish it, so it was available for the use of the lawyers and other people. Um, also, we didn't have West Publishing or the other companies that published the decisions of the courts. So Myra Bradwell, in her publication, would gather together these materials that lawyers needed in order to present their cases. So, uh, as Jim mentioned, the publication became widely read and uh, bought by lawyers and other people throughout the United States. So she had her forum, and she was and able she to use that very and, effectively. And to, she did to so to get women yeah. admitted to law schools, and mm -hmm. ultimately to get women admitted to the bar. She would Let's publish. Go ahead. No, please finish. Okay. Go I was going to say she would publish stories of uh, the women that were admitted to law schools and to the bars, and uh, she was very moderate, very logical, very well reasoned in um, presenting her case for women in law and the other causes that were near and dear to her heart, like suffrage. So she got the word out in a, a manner and a forum that it was very widely read and accepted by everyone. And uh, she usually just. Uh, rather than going into a diatribe about the judges and the law schools that would not admit women, she would let the people who denied women the right to practice or study law speak for themselves by publishing their own words, which were generally ludicrous. <laughs> so all she had to do was quote, quote the people themselves. Let's review what the Illinois Supreme Court said about Myra's petition. They said, quote, when the legislature gave to this court the power of granting licenses to practice law, it was not with the slightest expectation that this privilege would be extended equally to men and to women. This we are not yet prepared to hold. It was challenged at the United States Supreme Court. Let's hear what our highest court had to say. They said, and I quote, and it's hard to read these words, the natural and the proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many occupations of civil life. The paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and the benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. Bridget, how does that make you feel as a woman? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, is it true? Like, can, you, can we believe it? Like, are you too delicate to practice law? I don't think so. <laughs> are you too emotional, too illogical? No. No, of course no. you're not. No. It's a... We, different way of a woman and a man, different way of seeing probably the same problem, yes. Different approach, uh, but they make great team when they're, they're working together. And uh, employers seem to have a hard time with it, though. They have a hard time with women. That's yeah. been your experience. Yeah. You find that you believe there are still employers, do you not, that feel this way about oh, women? Oh, yes. Yes, they cannot say it to you directly, and they won't. And uh, just one thing like this, I'm, I'm going through job interviews, and they sure want to know if I'm married and if I do have children or if I'm planning to have children. But since they cannot ask it directly, so they ask me if I, I have a family. And so I said, yes, I have two brothers and a sister, <laughs> and uh, mother and father still alive. But sure enough, I don't get these jobs. <laughs> but yes, they, there's still some old-fashioned there. It's there. It's, it has changed the way, but it's still there, unfortunately. Carol. Nevertheless, much better than it was when yes. I graduated from law school. That much I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I was asked those questions directly, and the firms would sometimes kind of snicker behind their hand and apologize and say, but we have to know. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is, even in the mid-80s, many of us were so anxious and so competitive to get those jobs that we didn't speak out. And I regret that now. Mm -hmm. you know, I just Carol, you just returned, I understand, from, uh, from Washington, from the Supreme Court. How, what is your reaction, let me ask you that, to, to these words of our Supreme Court? 
Well, I first read those words when I was becoming a judge. I was um, about to be sworn in, and I found, I found this decision, and I read some of it in my swearing in. I was absolutely bowled over that it was less than 100 years, and that these attitudes pervaded the Supreme Court of the United States. And the contrast between that and going to visit the Supreme Court to interview Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the year 2000 is so striking because now we have two women. It's not a question of just having one woman. So, and um, I asked Ruth Bader Ginsburg that question about the significance of being number two because it's very important. You know, we always think of the first as being the most significant, but in fact, it's not until you have more than one that you really know that it, women are being accepted in any position. And it's part of the reason that when I decided to go to law school, I looked for a place where there were other women. It's very important to have that. Yeah. What were the reasons given by law schools for denying women the opportunity to take a seat in a legal classroom? Don? Oh, they ran the gamut from the sublime to the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, as we've talked about before, turned to the traditional and religious values of the woman's place is in the home, nurturing the children. That is the proper role for women, especially in the society of the Victorians, and that was a widely accepted social view. Others talked about how the rustle of the ladies' undergarments would distract the young gentlemen from their studies or um, just the attractiveness of female students would be such a distraction that the men couldn't possibly concentrate, which was rather insulting to both. Um, Tiara Farrow, when she applied to law school in Kansas City in 1901, was told that they had some night classes and no proper young lady could be out on the street um, without an escort after dark. To the school's credit, after she assured them that she would obtain proper escorts, uh, she was allowed in. But they really were silly in many cases. They couldn't come up with logic, so they grabbed whatever was handy. <laughs> Michael? Uh, um, one of the great heroines in the uh, New York bar was Florence Kennedy, uh, who Dawn writes about. And uh, Flo uh, applied to Columbia Law School in 1951. Uh, they had uh, uh, two excuses. One was they had no women's uh, bathroom facilities. And, uh, and, and so she turned around and, and she said, well, you're rejecting me not because I'm a woman, but because I'm a black person. And uh, she got him on that. <laughs> and they good couldn't, for her. They couldn't, they, and, and so she got in. Uh, as a black woman. Um, and she was one of the few attorneys of that generation uh, who, who went to law school in the 50s. And when I went to law school in the 60s, uh, Carol and I went to NYU. I went in 64 and Carol went in 65. And I She's going to get you for that after. Uh, well, we're, we're exactly the same age, but she took time off. Uh, but she and, looks younger. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. And, and this NYU, to its credit, uh, took women at the turn of the century. Uh, and other schools did not, as you know. But NYU did. They took a few. And by 1964, 10% of my class were women. And they were so proud of that. You know, 10%. Well, it's... it's but, but at that time, that was progress. Yes, it certainly was at um, that time. And all, I hate to it interrupt. It was a quota. <laughs> yeah, a quota. We need to take a break, so to our audience, please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Dad, where are you going? I'm going to go play a little golf. Why? Because it's Saturday, and that's the day that Dad plays golf. Why? Because I really like golf. But why? <laughs> well, good question. Because most of the time, I just spend the day chasing a little white ball around the course. Why? Well, usually it's because I hit the ball into the rough or out of bounds. Why? I don't know. Sometimes I wonder why I even took up this game. Maybe I'll cut back a little. Why? Well, for starters, maybe I could spend a few more Saturdays doing something with you. Hey, Dad? Huh? When? Family. Isn't it about time? <laughs> from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Before you know it, she talks. Before you know it, she walks. Before you know it, she knows you. Before you know it, she has a heart. Before you know you're pregnant, when your baby's no bigger than a grain of rice. Before she's a twinkle in your eye, that's when you need to take folic acid every day. After that, it's too late to prevent some serious birth defects. Folic acid now, before you know it. You know, I was there when Dr. King shared his dream with the world. I have a dream today. And I was there when we launched Men to the Moon. Lift off. I was even there when Mark McGuire broke the home run record. Yep, I've seen a lot in my day. Thanks to television, of course. <laughs> Welcome back to MSL Presents A Question of Law. Panel, our history books say so little about what life was like for our founding mothers. Would you take a moment and explain, in your own words, what you think life was like at that time for our mothers? Well, it was a total British-style patriarchy. Abigail Adams uh, said to her husband, the second president of the United States, John Adams, if you leave out the women in the political rights documents like the Constitution and so on, then uh, we'll foment a rebellion. And he laughed at her. The other point I want to <laughs> she make... She got him, though, didn't she? Oh, yeah. And, and not only that, but her son, John Quincy Adams, was very progressive on all the social mm -hmm. issues of the day in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And in that same period, women all over New England, Lowell, Lawrence, all around uh, where this TV show is being produced today, were going door to door, clamoring for the 10-hour workday. Women were slaving in sweatshop conditions in overheated factories, uh, doing a lot of the industry. There were more women in industry in the... Uh, beginning of our country than uh, there are today or later in the 19th century. And so women had a serious fight on their hands, not just to be recognized as equal human beings, but to get their labor rights. And that's important to remember. And they also were uh, in the leading edge of the anti-slavery struggle. And, I, and I'm so glad you wrote about that because that's a part of our history that people just don't know about. I didn't know about and right here in, in my own hometowns. Different question. Tell us a little bit about the history of women's rights in this country. Things such as coverture laws, the right to own property, to sue and be sued, and so forth. Carol? Well, that's the interesting thing, I think, about what the point Jim was making, that women had no rights. They, they couldn't own property. Their husbands had dominion over them to say whatever they wanted them Some to the do. Early laws governing, um, women were actually taken from the slave laws that were on the books and vice yeah. versa. That was something that just astonished me as I was researching this book. Um, and yet women it were property, just like slaves. And yet the contrast is that the women went and they fought for the rights of, of other people, mm -hmm. of the slaves. Well, I think no, that no issue brought about such mm -hmm. great response from women was the issue yes. of slavery. Yes. The human rights issues were very closely tied together. Many of the women that supported abolition also supported suffrage. Many of the role models for these early women attorneys were abolitionists who were fighting for the freedom of the slaves. So, you know, as, as we see today, many people who support human rights in one area cross over to support human rights in other areas mm -hmm. as well. And many of the early women lawyers fought for various causes in the human rights arena. And it changed as the decades went on um, mm -hmm. in that um, the issues changed slightly, but the women's involvement in them didn't change. Mm -hmm. So um, as we became more industrialized, the women became involved in the women's settlement movement. And when they realized that they could not succeed totally in that regard, um, helping women in the workplace, they then began to foment um, more revolution to get the right to vote and also to form uh, what later became known as the women's trade union movement. How was the inferior status of women justified? Well, it, like Dawn said, it comes out of the Bible. The Bible was written Don't remind me. <laughs> um, at a time when women had lost their place in society. You know, if, if, if you uh, look at it like an anthropologist, in the very early days, women were not inferior. Women had a major role to play in the development of humankind. Uh, it, it invented agriculture, pottery, medicines. Uh, they were totally equal. It was only when there got to be so much extra produced and the men wanted to get their hands on it and pass it off to their offspring 
that women were subjugated and the patriarchy came into place. And uh, that was about the time uh, that the Old Testament was written. So, so when, when you go back and you try to figure out when it happened, it happened you know, five, 6,000 years ago when women were totally subjugated. And they've been trying to crawl out of that hole ever since. And but why it did women go along? Well, I think they went along because they didn't see any possibility of changing it. And once society got wealthy enough so that they could have their own too, and they saw that there was a possibility of changing it, then they started to try to change it. Hey, you know, I think there's a real, a real material explanation you know, also for, many for why. Also, did resist from early on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, uh, Catholic women, for example, in medieval times had their own uh, institutions within the church, but by the 12th century, the church was uh, persecuting all those women as well. Then you had the witch hunts or, yeah. you know, the burning of witches and... Uh, and even uh, the women were resisting that as well. But one reason that it was tough to resist was that they would be executed. They would be burned. Well, they saw no other choice. As we get into Victorian times, a woman could either choose not to marry and never have a husband and family or to marry under the system of laws that was in place. And she really didn't have any other alternative open to her until things started to change in the mid-19th century. And one thing I found really admirable about looking at the way uh, the early women lawyers worked was that they helped one another ceaselessly. They all, almost all knew one another during the early days, even though they were scattered across the country mm -hmm. through people like Myra Bradwell, who brought them all together. Is it true that rape was viewed as a crime against a man and not women in those times? Of course, because when, when marriage occurred, the, the persona of the woman was totally merged into the man, and they became one and she had absolutely no rights. The man had all the rights. So a, a rape of a woman was a crime uh, against the man's property. Also because you have uh, uh, primogenitor, which means that you know, when stuff is inherited, it, it goes through the male line. Uh, uh, the rape is a crime because you couldn't figure out who's going to inherit because you don't know whose kid it is. So it messed up all the inheritance, right? <laughs> yeah. that, that was what the thinking. One of the thing that one of the things that women fought for in the early 19th century, right up through the famous Women's uh, Congress at Seneca in the late 1840s, was the right to have their own property. Meanwhile, Hispanic women, or Mexican women in the Southwest and so on, traditionally had always had property rights. And it's sort of ironic that at the Seneca Conference with that wonderful Declaration of Women's Rights, mm. they made no mention of what was being done to Mexican women at the time in the U.S.-Mexico War, and ever since that war, of course, uh, Mexican women have been subjugated in a kind of invisible minority until books like Hedda Garza's Latinas came out and Barred from the Bar and others. And Hedda does discuss this in the book as yes, well. Yes, she does. All the minorities. Discuss in the few remaining minutes, if you would, women's lack of educational opportunity generally and specifically for minority women. And how did that change? Jim? Well, it was particularly oppressive of minority women. Just forget Latinas and blacks. They could not get into any of the schools. White women could not get into the legal professions, and much less many of the colleges in the United States throughout the 19th century. Even with Mary Bradwell's heroic fight and those of her sisters that you mentioned, uh, very few were licensed to practice law by the time uh, Myra Bradwell died uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And with the Victorian age and Reconstruction, uh, the lid was put back on. Well, we had the uh, Jim Crow laws and so on, and, and even in black colleges like the Howard Law mm -hmm. School, Charlotte Ray had to apply, instead of under her real name of Charlotte Ray, as C.E. Ray, concealing her gender, at which point she was so brilliant, they accepted her, a black, famous black woman lawyer of the 19th century. And, and they had already <laughs> accepted her when they discovered that she was yeah. a woman. So yeah. then... But then they were stuck. But you know what <laughs> That's happened? really how it worked. She was, it's what they thought <laughs> anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> she was a corporate lawyer. Uh, and this applies today, too. She was a corporate lawyer, and she got out of law school, and she practiced in Washington for five years, and she couldn't make a living. Mm -hmm. And she finally wound up coming back to New York, where her parents uh, had raised her, and uh, she taught school to make a living. Mm -hmm. And to this day, women have trouble. Now, women uh, don't have trouble getting to law school. Uh, and half the law schools uh, have... Uh, are, Law schools have half uh, uh, women in their classes now. But when they get out, it's a different story because they still have trouble getting jobs, uh, rising in those jobs. Uh, even when they're working in the jobs, they find that the jobs are, are repellent. 
uh, they're antagonistic, they're hierarchical, they're authoritarian, um, and, they're, and if they had illusions, they're disillusioned, or, or they're disappointed, and they drop out, and, and they practice for a while, and then they go do something else, because it's not a pleasant way to make a living. Bridget, is, is Michael right? He's is that right. your experience? Yes, exactly. Yeah. He, he's so right. <laughs> and uh, I, I think like the best ways right now for a woman would be if she could become a civil servant for either federal or provincial government or lots of them also go in, into uh, teaching, university. Uh, that's where they, uh, they make their career. It's, um, it's tough for I think for everyone right now nowadays to find a full-time job even tougher for a woman and uh, years go by and then you they tell you employers that it's a lack of experience well for yes because if you're you're working like six seven months out of 12 yeah you you will eventually have a lack of experience you know, it's the circle is is running. It's it's turning. Like yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment of the show. I hope you'll come back and join me so we can see what's happened with the evolution of women in the legal profession. So, to our viewing audience, until next time, be well. Panel, thanks for joining me this afternoon.